Oh, rather grand entrance there. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this the second ARD Consultancy webinar. I'm Andrew Dawkins, and with me... And Rachel Blackhall. And we're delighted that you joined us today. Hope you're all fit and well. Thank you very much for your attendance. So what are we going to look at today, Rachel? So the agenda for today is we'll cover what's currently happening at ARD Consultancy. I'll pass over to you for a market update in terms of what's been happening in the investment markets. And then we'll discuss designing investment solutions um, and the asset classes to use within those. So we'll briefly explain what each of these areas cover and some of the advantages and disadvantages of each, but not, it is not an exhaustive list. Um, we'll only cover some of the points, otherwise we could be here all day. I think we're, we're actually here all day though. Well, we are, yeah, but our clients don't need to be. <laughs> we're aware that not all of our clients will be invested in these areas because there's always a number of factors to consider, such as specialist funds, ethical investments, and so on. But please bear with us. We just thought it'd be interesting to give you some insight into the methodology for construction of investment portfolios. So we'll run through a number of those asset classes and then see if there's any questions and answers at the end. So I think the idea is, uh, as we did last time, if you have any questions that come to mind just now, feel free to type those away and we'll, we'll try and get to them at the end. So uh, Rachel then, what's happening now in the, the office or the RD consultancy? Well, it's not really been a great deal of change in terms of how we're working here. Still um, myself and Andrew in the office and our other advisors are working from home. Uh, the biggest change is that we have now fully embraced Zoom. So since we can't conduct any face-to-face -face meetings in the office, this is the next best thing. It looks like it's going to be the way forward for the foreseeable future. But so far, we are big fans. We've found it really engaging, excellent to communicate to clients, just much easier than trying to do it over the telephone. So it's essentially a two-way video call um, and it allows the clients to view the tables and graphs and charts of all the different things that you'd normally cover at review meetings and um, can view the performance of the investments and pensions since the last meeting, see what's changed. And um, well, we, we think it's great. So if you've not already tried it, please do ask your advisor for a Zoom call at the next review. You've used it a lot recently, Andrew, haven't you? I have, I have, and uh, it's, it's been nice to all that uh, the majority of our clients have got dressed, I mean, which is uh, which is a bonus, but uh, you always get the word, odd one or two people, but uh, we like odd people. <laughs> uh, so what's happening next, Rachel? Now over to you. So tell us what's happening in the world of investments. Right, we'll, we'll do. Uh, since the, the, the webinar we had at the beginning of May, then the equity markets have really rebounded strongly as we predicted. Confidence is, is, is now back in the market. We're still not fully recovered in terms of where we were at the beginning of February, but the markets are soothed by the action taken by central banks and governments throughout the world. So over the last few weeks, we've seen a move away from some of the asset classes we're going to be talking about in a few minutes, such as fixed interest, back into equities. And the equity markets, by and large, throughout the world have all had quite remarkable turnarounds over the last few weeks. Uh, the, the, the biggest within our portfolio has been the, the UK smaller company market, which one of the funds we use at the moment has delivered a 14% return in the last four-week period. Uh, it's reflected, though, equally by markets in the, uh, the, the America, the Far East, and also Central Europe. So we're predicting going forward that we will still have a, a good period of recovery. There will be uh, along the way some sort of road bumps that we'll get to, especially if COVID reoccurs either in the next few weeks, months or later in the year. However, most of the clever people, and we know the clever people are just as daft as me, then they're saying that the worst of it is behind us because of the fact that even if COVID came back, we're more prepared or most nations within the world are better prepared. And in the UK, we never reached peak capacity. So there was that slack created. 
And I think what the governments have done throughout the world has been very, very welcomed by markets. So they've been soothed by that. So we're expecting a good run. And then later in the year, of course, we've got our, our old friend Brexit, which will rear its head again. It's already been started to, to appear in one or two news stories at the moment. And that, again, will be good for us because that creates volatility. And volatility is our long-term friend. So uh, another reason to be, uh, to be confident with what's uh, about to happen and what will happen. Uh, so a very, very good... Uh, Position we can look at the the returns generated by our five investment portfolios. Uh, as Rachel explained, not everybody will be invested in these portfolios, but a number of people will be. On the left hand side of the table, we show there our defensive uh, portfolio, and then on the right our aggressive. And as we explained before, each of the portfolios has a different equity component. The equity increases the risk, and therefore the general rule is. The higher the risk, the higher the returns, and that can be borne out. So actually, we can see here that, that most of the funds now, compared to where they were a year ago, are probably in the same position. But the defensive and cautious accounts are both actually up, and then the ones with higher equity components are down, but only down slightly when we, when we take off charges. Over the, the longer term, the three, five, and ten years, then the, the performance is, is, is really um, what we think superb. So if you're a defensive investor and you've remained with us over the last 10 years, you'll see the return of uh, around about 70%. Uh, our balance portfolio, which I think we have more client money than any of the other portfolios within, has seen the return of almost 130%. And the aggressive account, which is the higher equity holding, uh, then a return of 200% percent over that period actual returns delivered so very very pleased about the way that the investments have held up very pleased about um, the way that they're working and as far as we're concerned there's never a bad time to be invested and certainly there's, there's going to be some good times ahead because they're, they're always are um any any questions for me on that one rachel yeah no i think you've got an update from last month so all good thank you very much what are we going to do next Moving on to where we're going to start looking into these asset classes individually. So each of them are important to consider when we design, design any investment solution. So let's start with cash. Cash is really the easiest understood asset class. Uh, it's an English note you've used there, Rachel. On purpose, I must say. Oh, okay, okay. Well, <laughs> That's what it says on the tin. You always say it's worth more. Yeah, English notes are, yes. <laughs> So holding cash, so a number of advantages and disadvantages to consider. First of all, it's low risk. So really it just doesn't experience the highs and lows and valuations as much as the other asset classes. Uh, it's highly liquid. Ooh. And Andrew, care to explain? <laughs> so one of the things that here is that uh... At the start of the pandemic, one of the fears of the market, that the market being the big money movers in the world, the big uh, investment houses, fund managers, the difficulty they foresaw was actually having the ability to move out of asset classes such as shares and move into currency. They were fearful that there were, simply wouldn't be enough currency around. So what the, the Federal Reserve did in America and the Bank of England did here and the Central European Bank and banks throughout the world is they created that liquidity, which meant that they printed money so that if people wanted to get out of asset classes, they could and they could go into currency such as the, the dollar, the yen, the Swiss franc, which are all believed to be safe currencies or safer. So the governments through the banks created this liquidity, which calmed the market. So there wasn't a run with nowhere to go to, they, the, the cash saw large holdings and that really soothed things, the, uh, the market's liking the action taken. It is freely tradable and really the, the, there's no barriers to entry, everybody can hold cash, doesn't need to be through a, a stockbroker or any specialist, I'm sure everybody will have their own bank account. Uncomplicated, as I say, says that's what it says in the tin. Um, cash is safe. So if the banks or building societies fail, then you're protected by the compensation scheme. Well, what are the current the levels of compensation? So right now, if the bank or building society that you hold your monies in, you would get back uh, £85,000. That's per person, per provider. 
I think it's safe to say that I'm not sure any government would allow a bank, especially in the UK, to fail anyway. So um, it's, uh, it, it's pretty, pretty remote. There are some disadvantages. Um, cash generates relatively low returns. We find that a lot of our new business comes from people who say that they're disappointed with the rate of returns that they're receiving from their deposit accounts with the banks and building societies. Um, believe it or not, there are charges associated with holding cash. And Andrew, you made an interesting point on this yesterday. So how are the charges with cash? Well. I made an interesting point. <laughs> First time for everything. Uh, the charges really are in relation to either uh, in my experience in your own bank accounts that a number of banks now charge you for actually keeping your money with them in terms of uh, monthly fees. Perhaps they may uh, give you a free discount to a pizza or something like that or a travel insurance or something. Like in, in our dealings, though, when we're dealing with cash within investments, then we have to be careful because although we can hold cash with investments, as we'll see in a few minutes when we look at some slides, there are charges associated with those investments which could eat in or even reduce or eliminate the interest that we get from the, the, the bank cash accounts. So there are charges for the uh, looking after cash within investments that, that we certainly run. Cash does have poor long-term potential. So as I already mentioned, the interest rates are low. And you'll see from this slide here that cash savings don't always keep pace with inflation. So the, the blue bar along the bottom shows the NSNI cash ISA rate going back to 2008. And the yellow bar above it is the consumer prices index, so effectively your cash savings against inflation. And you'll see there that your cash savings don't always keep pace with inflation, which is reducing your buying power over time. Not good news. Uh, so in the past, we've actually looked at getting money not only from the UK, but investing in international cash accounts. Uh, there's been some big players in this, that the Bank of Ireland was a big producer together with the, latterly the ICICI Bank in India. And we can go around the world and uh, pick up cash rates and put them within investments. There are several challenges to this, and uh, on the right-hand side of the screen there, we show a logo of a, a collapsed Icelandic bank. Uh, some, of, some of you may be familiar with this. So they collapsed in 2008 following the financial crisis. They were offering outstanding cash rates, and a lot of investors in the UK, local governments included, were putting cash within this bank and saying, what a fantastic rate of return this is. Andrew, why are you not delivering the same rates of cash returns in the UK as we can get from Iceland? And like King Canute, they found that actually they couldn't hold back the tide and uh, they eventually folded because they couldn't generate the levels of uh, investment returns needed. And the UK government actually had to, to take action against Iceland and say, right, you want to, you give the money back to the investors or else we'll come after you. And after some wrangling, the, the Icelandic authorities did and compensated the UK investors. But it is a risk because of the fact that technically, when the account goes bust, Iceland being outside the EU was uh, able to sort of quite rightly say, well, sorry, I'm afraid you've lost all your money. It was only about the UK putting pressure on them that they actually compensated. So it is one of the risks that we've got is that you can, outside the UK and outside the EU, you don't have the same level of investor protection. The other thing was that in 2008-9, when the government embarked upon the quantitative easing, they had to reduce all cash rates because the level of debt taken on by governments was humongous and uh, they couldn't afford, governments couldn't afford the rates of cash to be any more than needed because of the debt commitment that they'd actually engaged in. So these days, we very seldom find that we're advantaged by going outside the UK for bank rates. And because of the extra risk that we've got, not, not only within a local country, but also the fact that we have an exchange rate risk so that when we bring in profits back into the UK, if sterling falls in value or rises in value, we could get less or more back. And so there's an extra level of risk. So international account, cash accounts really are a thing of the past 
they may come back, but with the world taking concerted in, uh, efforts to actually make sure that cash yields very little because of the level of debt, we can't see cash becoming attractive in the near future. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the next one, which is fixed interest, also known as bonds. This is effectively lending money to companies, as the name suggests. Investors will receive a fixed level of return, which is known as a coupon, in exchange for lending money for a certain period of time, which is known as a duration. The interest is usually paid every six months, and at the end of the loan period, the initial capital will be repaid. In the meantime, though, that debt can be traded on a regular basis. It's actually very rare that the debt is repaid to the original purchaser. Mm -hmm. And then, advantages and disadvantages to consider here. So again, it's also one of the, the lower risk asset classes, but that does not mean there's no risk. A greater potential return than cash. So companies that are looking to raise finance will tend to offer a better rate of return than what's available on cash accounts to make an attractive option to investors. So if you're lending money to a company, you'd expect to receive more money than you could through a bank or balance society. Yes, that's it. Yeah, liquidity. Um, so it's relatively easily tradable. Uh, there is quite a good market for this area. Not quite as much as cash, but there is a demand. So they said that they will. That's why it's never always repaid to the original purchaser. And international. We're not limited to the UK, so we will look at options for lending money to companies overseas for slightly better returns. Inflation. So as the coupon is set at outset, so your rate of return is agreed at the time of purchase, the, see for example, the bond returns 2% and inflation is at half a percent. That's quite a good return. But if inflation goes up to 3%, that level of return is less attractive, which could cause some difficulty in trading. So really people wouldn't be wanting to buy a debt that's only giving them a return of less than inflation. Yeah. So therefore the price of that particular debt will reduce if you're trying to sell it on. Yeah, yeah. so something to consider as inflation changes. So while liquidity is an advantage, it can also be a disadvantage because there does have to be a market for it. If you wanted to bail out Say, for example, the company is in financial difficulty, that could cause some challenges when trying to sell it on. For example, right now, um, airlines. So trying to sell on the debt of an airline could be challenging. Currency. So as I said, because the rate of return is set at the outset, you'll receive that set, or set rate of return, but with exchange rates fluctuating, the monetary amount that you could receive could change. And that this is if you're holding debt outside the UK, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And finally, there is that default risk. So there is the possibility that the company you've lent the money to could default on the interest due and or default on the loan itself. I think you've got some example of recent defaulters, Rachel. Here we go. Yeah, we wouldn't want to be with these uh, companies at the moment, although there may be a market because if you're a shareholder in any of these companies, the, the likelihood of getting anything back is remote. However, if you actually have debt on or debt lent to these companies, then you do rank higher up the pecking order once the uh, administrators have been in and distributed any remaining assets, you are higher up than the ordinary shareholders. So you might get something back although this is the risk. Uh, so when, we, when we're looking at who, sh who we should lend money to, then we use the credit agencies, and there are, there are three or four major credit agencies throughout the world, and they will uh, judge each um, company wanting to raise uh, finance. They will give them a rating, and these ratings range from... As we'll see here, junk bonds. So really, these are companies without a lower credit rating. And generally, you receive more interest because of the perceived risk. 
So although they're known as junk bonds, doesn't mean they're necessarily small companies. The ones you'll see on your screen here, I'm sure everyone will have heard of. Um, recently, all these companies raised finance. Um, interestingly enough, or so I thought, was that Ford was downgraded on March the 25th. It was previously an investment grade, which is a higher up the scale, down to a junk bond. Mm -hmm. um, they raised $8 billion to weather the falling sales. So the, the pandemic's really quite affected them and they've had to raise quite a bit of money to try and weather that. Uh, Netflix raised a billion dollars, which is for general corporate purposes. Golf days. <laughs> um, it's likely to include content acquisitions for production and development. As so more and more people are engaging with that during lockdown. Uh, Uber raised $900 million, which is thought to acquire Grubhub. So that's a rival for their Uber Eats side of the business. And some examples of investment grade bonds. Yes, so these are the been awarded a higher credit rating. Uh, T-Mobile raised $19 billion wow. to finance the acquisition of another rival company, a telecom company called Sprint. And Cisco, so they distribute food and equipment to restaurants in the US, so oh, obviously they've been bonds. affected as well. <laughs> and they raised $4 billion. Uh, to, this was to repay outstanding borrowings, including the redemption of $750 million of its 2.6% coupons that are due. So this is a prime example of how companies trade debt in favour of a lower rate. So it's something to constantly keep an eye on, and as things change, companies will try and trade it and sell it off. Okay. And the final slide on this section shows one of the investment funds that we use that trades in corporate debt or bonds. And this is for the UK companies at the lower end of the risk scale, so generally investment grade bond. And the, the red line here shows the actual performance against the retail prices index. So we can see it's not as exciting a return over the five year period as say equities, but it does tie in nicely with the fact that we're saying it's a lower risk asset than the equity side of things. So that gives you an example of one of the funds that we, we use and recommend for our clients. Moving on now to... Gilts. So what is a gilt, Andrew? Ah, thanks for that question, Rachel. <laughs> so gilt's just a, a posh, posh name for, for government debt. And uh, as we know, just at the moment, governments throughout the world are raising huge amounts of, of debt. And this is financed by generally in investment houses, pension funds, investment companies, giving the government money in return for a rate of interest, again, a coupon. And the, the rate of interest is set again at outset. Most of the, 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 the gilts these days are fixed rates of return. In the past though, we have had inflation linked gilts and the duration the term can, can be anything for, from one year uh, through to 30 years or even the, there's been now gilts issued for 100 years and the idea is again that these will be tradable so again very very rarely does the same person collect the eventual proceeds than that than was at the outset the, the advantages, some of the advantages of using it, again, it's considered to be a, a safer, less risky asset class with less volatility than the likes of shares. It's tradable, so uh, UK gilts are bought throughout the world, just as we buy gilts uh, from other com countries, and there's a market for that. It's considered to have a, a lower default risk, so the, the UK government in its history has never defaulted on, on any of its debt. Uh, on the disadvantages side though, there are some countries that have defaulted uh, in recent years, Argentina, Russia and Pakistan have all defaulted within the last 20 years. Uh, interestingly though, Rachel, I'll ask you a question here. Do you know which country has defaulted the most on its debt? I'll give you a clue. It's not Greece, surprisingly. If you want to guess a country, just shout anything. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot there. Just, um, Italy? Is that not? It's a good guess. I can see where you're going with that. It's actually Spain. So oh. Spain holds the record of defaulting most on its government debt. Uh, uh, so you do have to take that into account when you're uh, actually picking picking gilts. 
what are the chances of actually a country not paying its debt? Uh, inflation is a, another disadvantage, again, for the same reason as the fixed interest element. As inflation is, is perceived to rise or fall, so the price you will be able to trade your guilt fall will rise and fall. So again, if inflation is at 2% and your guilt return is half a percent, not such a good risk. But if you think inflation is going to fall to 0% and you're getting a half, half a percent return, you may consider that a good uh, market. So therefore, you will get a lot of trades when inflation is perceived to, to rise or fall. And then finally, the same disadvantage we have with fixed interest, the currency risk. So as currencies moved again against the pound, we could then see that the actual return we end up with when it comes back into this country is more or less than we were expecting. Um, some ideas here of the latest uh, guilt rates for 10-year debt. And uh, we can see here, oh dear, no, there are some funny colours here for me, but um, <laughs> can, you you make, can you make them out, Richard? Yes, thank you. So UK is 0.20%, Germany is negative 0.30%, France also negative 0.06%, Italy is 1.43%, USA 0.69%, and jumping way up here we have India in green, that's 5.75%, and Mexico at the end here, 6.18%. Um, the, the glaring question from that screen I would say is why would anybody want to purchase a negative yielding guilt? So Germany and France are negative rates. Oh, you want me to answer that? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, the, the reason for that is because uh, guilt's considered to be a, a safer investment. It's going to be compared against cash. Now, in Central Europe at the moment, most of the countries there are actually working at negative cash rates. So if, if big institutional investors or big companies with large amounts of cash, if they held, held them with the bank, the bank actually wants money from them to keep their currency within the bank now you're looking then at well okay if i'm being charged half a percent say a year for you to look after my cash what's another safe option and one of the safe options is well if i lend money to the german government i know there's very little chance of it defaulting and actually a negative interest rate as long as it's not as negative as the interest rate that a bank's giving me is actually a better return than just keeping the money with the bank so there is an attraction for that. Um, interestingly, last week, the government here in the UK launched its first negative uh, guilt, the three-year guilt, providing less than, uh, less than zero return, and it was snapped up. So they, they, they sort of had a lot of investors paving the way, perhaps, for UK interest rates to go into negative territory in the near future something that the Bank of England for, for many years has said is never going to happen. And it's a big day, debate that they're having at the moment in, in the US, with Donald Trump in particular wanting to see negative interest rates. But the Federal Reserve saying, well, actually, negative interest rates don't do actually any benefit at all. So that's the attractive of a negative, that it is negative, but it's not as negative as the money being left with the banks or the building societies. The big thing here is why they have negative rates in general is to encourage companies, big institutional investors, not to keep the money in cash, but to go out there and spend either acquisitions or improving their own products. So they don't really want money in the bank. They want it to be used to create employment and prosperity. Um, and that's going to be the, the, the way it is for, for many a year, we would assume, and why that, that is. The, the, the interest rates offered by Mexico, well, crikey, yes, at 6%. But you've got to consider them. We've got the currency risk, but we've also got the perceived default risk as well, which is why we get such a, a great rate of return in Mexico. But would we really want to invest there? <laughs> and right here. This is our UK guilt fund, or one of them. And you'll see here that the line above, the red line, is the actual returns, meaning it's one of the best asset classes in the last five years. So a low, consider a low risk, and normally consider your low yielding 
uh, investment has delivered superb returns. In fact, as, as long as we've been uh, working together, Rachel and I, every investment seminar we go to, mm -hmm. people stand up at the front and say, this is the end for guilt, the market's going to collapse, the, there is no profit to be had in it. And yet we keep on with it. And uh, so, again, what sure. do the experts know, hey? <laughs> And moving on to UK equities. By this we mean investing in shares and companies that can be bought on the UK share exchange systems. So in the equity market, as Andrew said before, higher risk potential for higher returns. The reason that we invest in this area is to make money by simply buying and selling the shares for a profit. Uh, the price of the shares don't always have to increase though. It could just be that we take dividends from these holdings. There's a number of big companies that have historically paid dividends, BP, Shell have been well known for that. And um, there's a number of UK share exchange systems. We've got the FTSE 100, which everyone's heard of that one. Um, interestingly enough, this is the largest index with around 80% of the value of all UK companies within this one sector. And Rachel, just before you move on, do you know what the UK's largest company is today by market size? AstraZeneca? Very good guess. So we've yeah, got, no, it's not a guess, is it? <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, well. AstraZeneca, <laughs> then we have Unilever, and then we have Shell. Um, then there's the FTSE 250. So these are companies that will fall below the top 100. Um, you'll see there that Marks and Spencers are in the FTSE 250. For many, many years, they were in the top 100, but uh, since dropped out of there. It's interesting, if, if a company does fall out of the top 100, not only is it a bit of an insult to them, but it, the, also the potential that they actually lose money because a lot of, or a good number of investment funds in the UK will only consider buying shares in the top 100 companies, or a lot of the tracker funds have to have shares in direct proportion to the ownership within the top 100. So a company moving out from the 100 into the 250, it can have quite a, a bad impact on its bottom line because of the demand just disappears overnight because a lot of shares are, are traded uh, on the basis of rules and regulations put down by the fund managers and the fund managers will have rules saying, no, nope, we're only gonna deal with top 100 companies. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the AIM index. This is usually the smaller companies, um, I'm going to say smaller, I mean by market size or turnover. Um, not necessarily, again, companies that we've not heard of, it could just be that they are just voting for the first time to now buy shares in them. A couple of my favourites on the side there. <laughs> oh, which was that, Eddie Stobart? <laughs> <laughs> Mulberry's not on there as an accident. <laughs> Very good. When's your birthday? <laughs> Uh, the advantages and disadvantages of UK equities. And we'll start with capital growth. This is where we try and make that profit. Um, could be by dividends. The liquidity. So again, those those top companies, we tend to say that's an advantage. You'll have that liquidity. It's fairly easily tradable. It's a, a very popular stock market. Uh, the good thing about these stock markets is they have a long history, so we can do quite thorough research and look back at how a number of these companies fared during specific time periods before we look to include them in any portfolios. There is also the risk of other completely losing the money. So if you have 100% of your money in one company and that goes bust, then you, you'd have lost everything. There's also liquidity risk because for those smaller companies, there really needs to be somebody who wants to buy your shares. Oh, I see you were looking at me there. Weren't you? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I drifted off for a moment. <laughs> Nothing to do with your presentation. Thanks for staying with us. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's the drink. Lack of it. Uh, one of the challenges we found with uh, recently in the last uh, few months is a, a very well-known fund manager and one of his funds actually fell into difficulty because of the fact that he'd actually set it up to buy and sell shares in very small companies in terms of market size. And he found the difficulty was when withdrawals were coming in at such a rate, he was unable to sell the shares because there wasn't a market. 
and as a result that fund was put on hold so no transactions could take place and um, so it is a it is a disadvantage if you if you're investing in smaller funds and uh, the, the methodology behind that needs to be understood um, and finally uh, there's always a risk of the change in consumer demands and, and fashions and what's popular um, prime example of that is Marks and Spencers many people say just because it didn't keep up with the changing fashions and trends that that caused them to to fall down into the, the 250 sector out of the 100. There we go. What does this uh, chart then show us, Rachel? So this is one of our UK equity funds benchmarked against the RPI index again. So you'll see there it's fairly volatile and there was a, a big drop at the start of the year, but vastly outperformed. Yes, that's, that's good. We're nearly there, folks. <laughs> uh, we also have international equities. So same principles apply here but we would have to consider a couple of other factors um, and, and risk factors of that. So yeah. we can use, we can use uh, international equities, although uh, we, in, within our portfolios, we, we predominantly have UK equities because the market's uh, understood and we don't have the currency risk and the political risk, but, but here we see some of the, the world's largest companies and why not own shares in them as well? Yeah, so we'll look to mix the international and the UK equities to try and provide that diversification and ultimate growth. We won't go over all these points again, like I said, they're very similar to our, our UK side. Um, we do have just a couple of extra points on the disadvantages, which is currency and political. Um, do you want to expand on the political side, Andrew? Yeah, well, I think a, a, a case in point just at the moment is what's going in, on in Hong Kong and China that uh, that's moved back up and people are starting to talk about trade tensions between America and China and uh, Hong Kong could be a, a, a case in point whereby you've got to be conscious of the, the politics of a con country and also the fact that uh, in some countries is the information actually as transparent as it is elsewhere in the world can we really believe the facts and figures we, we're given and so that's something we need to, to bear in mind when we're designing some of the portfolios and, and saying well actually we, we're not holding assets in a particular region or country not that the assets are perhaps uh, uh, any, any, anything wrong with them, but simply because of the fact that the information we have from them, I'm not sure we can believe it. And the last asset class for today is property. Uh, by property, we mean commercial property. So we've taken the view to include UK commercial property in our portfolios at the moment. Um, it includes factories, warehousing, retail, offices, hotels, care homes, and for this sector, advantages, it's a real asset. You could go and see the building if you want. You can see what you're getting for your money. What about if there's an underground car park? There's ways and means to get underground. Oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Practical growth. So if the property prices increase, you make money. There's an income stream. So the, the rental payments that these companies will receive from the tenants provide that income. Diversity, like I said, there's a number of different types of properties, different areas in the country. It's uncomplicated, bricks and mortar. Disadvantage on this one would be liquidity. As you many of you will know, at the moment, and we covered in our last webinar, um, extreme market conditions can cause liquidity issues. Um, for example, our fund, the property funds that we have at the moment, is suspended just because they can't get out to value the properties. So if you did want to make a withdrawal, there may be times where that's not possible, it's just delayed. There's always a tenancy risk. The tenant may not pay their rent, may not be able to pay their rent. The change in demand again, um, for example, demise of the high street. So those tenants or those people who have properties in the high street could be struggling at the moment. 
Uh, there's high costs associated with this sector. So to buy and sell properties, there's always uh, legal costs, so, um, tax, Sorry. surveys. And I think that sort of wraps us up on our asset classes. Um, thank you for bearing with us while we're going through that. I'll pause the moment and we'll see what questions you have and if we can get the answers to you right now. Hi there. Right, so we have a couple of questions in, uh, from one from Lenny here. Uh, Andrew, any comment on government borrowing to fund COVID? Okay, thank you very much Lenny for your, your questions. Hope you're enjoying yourself in the, the sunshine, and not down your shorts as well. It's good to see. Um, yeah, the, the, the government action to, to get around the COVID crisis is to create this borrowing, which then is used in a number of ways to provide grants to, to businesses, business owners, and also then to uh, assist in making sure that as few people as possible are laid off and through the job retention scheme. Now, when we're actually looking at the level of debt being uh, created by this, actually not all that debt is lost to the UK. So if we look at somebody's wages that have been subsidized, then a lot of time that money will be spent on things like food. Now that then creates VAT, which is a revenue for the chancellor. It creates profit for the business. It creates demand for the supplier. So it, it does a lot of good. They also have to pay national insurance contributions on that and income tax. So where the government spends, say, a billion pounds a week on these benefits, it recoups quite a lot of that in taxes and also keeps other companies such as uh, the likes of Tesco's, for example, in business, making their profits more. And therefore, Tesco, at the end of this year, one would presume is going to pay more tax. So it actually has a good effect. Whereas a lot of spending is on big infrastructure projects, then many people believe this doesn't act as a big a stimulus as it could to simply giving cash to members of the public because of the fact that when we do these in big infrastructure spends, a lot of the contractors and the equipment used is from overseas. So the big earth moving equipment may come from America. Some of the technology we use may come from France, Germany, or even China, etc. And this profit then goes away from the, the country. So doing what they're doing, that's what they're doing. What they've done is actually very, very good for us and for the economy. And I think the, the government in general should be praised for the, the action it's taken. It has to be said, it's, it's replicated throughout the world. But uh, I don't know many economies that haven't uh, done some form of uh, assistance to their, to their, um, to their people. Super, but thank you very much for that, Lenny. Uh, another one in from Graham. What are your thoughts on investing a portion of investments in gold, silver, or Bitcoin? Yes, it's a, it's a very good uh, question. Uh, one of the things we have to consider is where we actually go to, to, to buy this. And simply, the, the, the only thing you can do with gold is actually own the commodity. So we would have to physically go out and buy gold and then hold it in the safe somewhere. And it would actually cost quite a bit to actually do that. The, there aren't that many direct gold funds to be used. Uh, there are a number of natural resources funds or commodity funds, but these tend to be very, very specialist and very, very volatile. And when we analyze them, actually don't make as much money with as little risk as we would want to include within our portfolio. So the difficulty sometimes is that although they can be good assets, it's quite difficult to build within a portfolio. 
So we do come across uh, clients that will own the, the odd Bitcoin or, or perhaps have some gold, but more of a, uh, including in the portfolio, it's very, very difficult to do and achieve. Great, I hope that answered your question there. Uh, I think we have another. There's one more just come in from Declan. Will stocks likely plummet when Q2 GDP figures around the world get released? Well, that's a, that's a good question, Declan. And uh, the, the, the answer to that is, is no, because what they, the markets do is they're, they're almost two steps in front. So that when COVID came along, initially the, the markets fell by a percentage when they thought it was just a Chinese phenomenon and that the world would continue by and large as it was, albeit with a, a, a longer lead in time to getting goods from China. And then when it became clear that it wasn't just a Chinese event, this and it was worldwide, so when we got the run about the third week in February, then the markets really panicked and said it was the end of the world. It was the end of the world and uh, everything would change as we know it and the markets died. And we've got the biggest fall in such a short period of time that we've actually witnessed since 1987. So what's happened since then is that uh, as countries have progressed and that the virus has been brought under control, then the analysts and the companies are actually saying, well, actually, yeah, we can actually see a bit of a, a brighter future and they build that back into the market. However, at the moment, they've already anticipated the dent in um, production, the dent in profitability, the dent in output through countries throughout the world. And I said, well, actually, the, this, this, this period, 2020, is going to see all parts of the economy just about fall in value and down considerably on where we were this time last year. So they've built that into the price. And they've also built into the price, we believe, a second decade epidemic of the COVID virus either in the next few few months or at the end of the year when the, the flu season traditionally returns here in the Western Europe. So it's built into the price already, Declan, and they anticipate that the worst and they're sort of building now for the next part, which will be going into, into next year. The good thing as well, remember with our portfolios, is that uh, we tend to avoid those sectors that are very cyclical. So again, we don't have any airlines in the portfolio, any holiday operators, uh, anything that's really uh, subject to market whims and, and fantasies. So um, a lot of the stock we've got is quite boring, but it does make money. And that's the thing that delivers the returns. So just because of the fact that the, the, the world goes into recession, for example, it does mean that stocks we've carefully got on our books and the assets, such as commercial property, lending money to, to companies and governments, hold up very, very well. And that's why it's, a, it's always a good time to be invested, providing you're in there for the, for the medium to longer term. Um, um, is that us for time? That's us for today, yes. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning and taking time out of your morning, out of the sunshine. Um, we've been bouncing some ideas back and forth for how we could change it up and keep it interesting for you. So we're perhaps going to look at something different for our next webinar. Yes, you, yes, I'll, I'll probably not be in the building. Is that what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> You're sick of hearing our voices. And um, if there's anything, again, if you do want to hear about anything in particular, please just let us know. Yes, and thank you very much for all your feedback from the, the last event. It was very, very heartwarming to hear all your, your lovely yes. words and comments. And uh, thank you very much for that. And have a, have a great weekend. And we we'll look forward to seeing you shortly. Thank you.